מראשית נרא אלוהים את השמיים ואת הארץ. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. From the San Diego, California headquarters of the Institute for Creation Research, here are ICR scientists and Back to Genesis lecturers, Dr. John D. Morris and Ken Ham. John, I believe the issue of the age of the Earth is one of the most important in the creation-evolution controversy because obviously if the Earth is not billions of years old, then evolutionists do not have the time that their theory requires. Ken, I really believe that the Earth is only thousands of years old, just like the Bible says. But I'm also aware that of all the issues, this is perhaps the most difficult for Christians to accept. And yet there's a wealth of solid scientific information which points to the young Earth. In order to understand it and accept it, we have to overcome all the indoctrination that we've received regarding millions of years, particularly in regard to the various dating methods. In this program, Dr. Morris explains these dating methods. He also provides strong positive evidence, not only for a young Earth, but to show that true science does not support an old Earth concept at all. Prepare for some new exciting insights as you watch this fascinating program. Our lecture for this hour is a a bottom line issue in this whole creation evolution controversy, that of the age of the earth. How old is the earth? The creation and evolution models are extremely different as it relates to the age of things. The evolutionary uniformitarian concept is that the earth is on the order of four and a half billion years old. The universe is on the order of 15 billion years old. Only in the last three or four billion or so years did life come into existence and then on the order of a billion years or so ago multicellular life came into existence and then humankind only in the last uh, uh, one to three or so million years. The creation model says something quite different. The creation model says that all things were created just thousands of years ago in the literal six day uh, creation period and that the surface of the earth, the, the surface of the earth that we can study today all date back pr primarily from Noah's flood on the order of four and a half or so thousand years ago. Quite different and we would think that as scientists we ought to be able to tell the difference between these two. As we know however, evidence, data, facts such as rocks and fossils can be interpreted in more than one way. There's more than one valid interpretation of the rocks and fossils. I'm convinced that if one adopts a biblical set of presuppositions, a biblical mindset before he looks at the rocks and fossils, that the interpretation that will be derived from those rocks and fossils will always be better than the evolutionary interpretation. Particularly as we, as we look on the, uh, the age of things, how old is the earth? Now, I'm a geologist. I like rocks and fossils. But when we're asking the question, how old are these rocks? How old are these fossils? How did these things get to be the way they are? Then, well, the rocks, funny thing about rocks is that you can ask them those questions all day long and, then, and they'll never talk back to you. They'll never tell you how old they are. When you dig up a rock, it doesn't come with a label on it. You've got to interpret that evidence and come to your conclusions based on, on uh, what you see. Remember that science is limited to the present. We've got the rocks and the fossils in the present. We can study them in the present. We can interpret them in the present. But when we're asking the question about the unobserved past, then to a great extent we're outside the realm of science, particularly empirical science. We're talking about history. We're talking about reconstructing the past, a historical reconstruction. And for that reason, this issue of the age of things is is pseudoscience. It's, it's extra science. It's, it's not empirical observational science. I'm also convinced that even if the earth is four and a half billion years old, even if the earth is old, even if the universe is 15 billion years old, there's still not enough time for evolution to take place. There's no evidence that evolution did take place. There's no evidence that it could take place. Time is not necessarily the friend of evolution, but it is true that it's only as we shroud the past in the mist of time that we're able to, to some degree, 
make evolution sound credible. The idea is illustrated in this quote here by George Wall, one of the most famous evolutionary spokespersons of our day. He says, in evolution, time is the hero of the plot. Given enough time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. Well, I'm here to tell you that time doesn't perform miracles. Time doesn't help evolution. In fact, I'm convinced that time is the enemy of evolution. Everything is pointed in the wrong direction for evolution to occur, and the more time you have, the more time you have to go in the wrong direction. But of course, if the earth is young, I mean, if the earth is only thousands of years old, then evolution is, is folly. How do we as scientists go about this task of interpreting the past, of, of answering the question, how old is this rock? How old is this system? How long has this been in operation? Well, the way we do it, the, the only way that can be done, really, since rocks don't come with labels on them, is to find a process that's going on, such as radiometric decay, uranium changes into lead, or whatever process we're measuring, and if we can measure that process and, and get a process rate, how fast uranium changes into lead, or how fast this process goes on, and we can make some other assumptions and, and measurements, then we can perhaps calculate how long would it take for this process to have produced the present state of things. That's basically the, the question that's being asked when we ask how old is this rock. Now, I don't know about you, but most people don't necessarily think about these processes uh, a whole lot, and so uh, when we start talking about uranium changing into lead and all, it, it, we bog down somewhat in, um, in scientific information. And, and let, me, let me illustrate this, and let me make it uh, understandable with a parable. Suppose when you came in a while ago from the break, suppose you saw me up here on the platform, and I had a bucket of potatoes before me. This is the parable of the potato bucket, okay? I had a bucket of potatoes, and you notice that every minute I reached in that bucket, pulled out a potato, and peeled it and put it back in. And you sat down and you watched. As the second hand got up to 12, uh, every minute I reached in and picked out a potato, peeled it, and put it back in. And you sat there for 10 minutes, and you watched me peel a potato, one every minute for 10 minutes. Okay? And finally you asked the question, how long has this nut been doing that? All right? That's exactly the same question. How old is this rock? How old is this potato bucket? You have measured me peeling potatoes now, one per minute for 10 minutes. So how long have I been doing that? How can you calculate how long I've been peeling potatoes? What would you do? Well, you'd probably come up and you'd count the peeled potatoes. How many peeled potatoes are there in the bucket? Well, let's say you come up and there are 25 peeled potatoes in my potato bucket. Now, how long have I been peeling potatoes? 25 minutes? Well, maybe. Hmm. Were you there when I peeled all those potatoes? You weren't there, and so you've got to make some assumptions about that process. Well, there are assumptions that you don't really know to be true, but maybe they're reasonable, maybe not. First off, you've got to make the assumption that throughout the whole history of this potato bucket, that I have been peeling potatoes at one per minute, that I've never been faster, never been slower. Is that a valid assumption? <laughs> Maybe it's a pretty good assumption. Is it right? Well, you don't know if it's right or not. You don't know. Maybe I'm getting better at it and I can peel potatoes faster than I could at the start. Or maybe I'm getting tired and I'm slowing down. You've got to make the assumption that the rate that this process has been going on has been the same throughout the past and that that rate has been responsible for, for producing this whole bucket full of peeled potatoes. There's another assumption that you've got to make. You've got to make the assumption that throughout the whole history of that potato bucket, nobody has come into this room and added peeled potatoes to my, peel pota to my potato bucket. Now, you don't know Dr. Gish. Maybe you know Dr. Gish. Dr. Gish is a real joker. If he sees a bucket full of potatoes, he's the type of guy that would come in and dump all his peeled potatoes into the bucket. And if he did that, then there are peeled potatoes in my potato bucket that didn't get there through the peeling process. And so your assumption that this has been closed off from the environment is not valid. Or perhaps, 
Ken Ham has come in. He's the type of guy that will eat potatoes, just right out of a potato bucket. <laughs> You've got to make the assumption that nothing has ever happened to this process that would have either added peeled potatoes to the bucket or taken them away from the bucket throughout the whole history of the process. There's another assumption that you've got to make. You've got to make the assumption that when this process started, when I first came in and brought the, peel, the, the potato bucket into the, to, to the platform, that there were no peeled potatoes there to start with. Is that a valid assumption? Well, maybe it's a reasonable assumption, but is it right? We don't know that it's right. This potato bucket parable illustrates exactly how it is that scientists go about dating a process, dating a rock, dating a, a, a riverbed, dating whatever. They measure a present processes and make some assumptions about the unobserved past and, and then go about the, the, the process of, ex, of extrapolating that present rate into the past and um, come with some conclusions about the date of the thing. This is what happens with radiometric dating. The same, exact same assumptions are involved. As I mentioned, uranium atoms, like uranium-238, changes into lead. Uranium changes into lead. It's an unstable element. It's radioactive. It gives off, uh, it gives off uh, emissions. And, well, we can measure the rate of that process today. We can measure how fast uranium changes into lead. We can measure that. The half-life of these uranium atoms are extremely long, like four and a half billion years for a half-life, if you know the concept. Is it a valid assumption to make the assumption that that half-life has not changed throughout the past? I mean, we've measured it now for several decades, and we found it to be fairly constant. We just can't change that rate to any significant degree. Well. Is it true then that that rate has not changed throughout the billions of years of supposed Earth history? Well, maybe that's a valid assumption, but is it right? We don't know that it's right. And in fact, maybe those decay rates were different in the past, but I tell you what, if I were to argue uh, radiometric dating and, and the age of the Earth with someone, I would argue from these assumptions, but I wouldn't argue assumption number one. That's a, that's a fairly good assumption. That's a reasonable assumption. Uh, we've been able to measure this rate for 30 or 40 years now. To assume that it hadn't changed in billions of years, that irritates me that scientists would do that, but maybe that's the best we can do, and maybe that's a good working hypothesis. But assumption number two is a little different. Assumption number two is one of the weaker links in the chain, and that is that no loss or gain of the, of the parent uranium or the daughter lead uh, has been added to or, or, or taken away from that rock throughout its, its past. You see, we pick up a rock, we measure how much uranium and how much lead is in there, and we assume that the rate of change of uranium into lead has been the same throughout the past, and, well, we've got to assume also that no lead or uranium has been added to or taken away from that whole system throughout its history. Now, is that a valid assumption? I think not. That's, there's some real problems with that. In fact, there are many different ways, many ways that we know well, uh, in which uranium or lead can be added to or taken away from a rock, groundwater percolating through, or, or just a variety of things. Biologic activity can, can leach these things out or, or concentrate them. And, and so it's, it's difficult for us to know that this thing has been closed to the environment, although I must admit that when samples are gathered, an effort is made to try to gather samples that give no indication that they've been open to the environment for any length of time. But to say that they've been totally isolated from the rest of the universe for a billion or four or five or years, <laughs> you see, that's not a real good scientific assumption, especially since we know many ways in which these things uh, can, be, uh, can be tampered with. Assumption number three, however, is the real Achilles heel of, of radiometric dating. And that is the one that, that's, uh, that talks about how many potatoes were there in the start, in the bucket at the start. How much lead was there at the start? You see, if you pick up a rock and it's got uranium and lead, you make the assumption that all of that lead got there through uranium decay. But if some of that lead was there at the start, then when that rock was first formed, it already looked like that process may have been going on. 
How can we know that? Well, actually we can test this. There are rocks that are being formed today that we can date radiometrically and we know their age. I mean, we know exactly how old they are. It's also important to recognize that these dating methods are only good for igneous rocks like lava and basalt and granite. You can't date a sandstone or a limestone with these methods. They're not designed for those, for those sorts of rocks, those sedimentary rocks. They're only good for rocks that used to be in a liquid form, like liquid lava has turned now to, to solid, solid rock. So it's only good for, for igneous rocks, rocks with no fossils in them. Rocks with fossils in them are dated through the assumption of evolution, by the way. That assumption, of course, I think is, is totally false. But with the radiometric schemes, the, um, we, we, can, we can test this assumption number three because there are lava rocks being formed today. There are basalts that are formed today. And we, can, we know that Mount Kilauea erupted at a particular year back in the 1800s, say, and we go out and we pick up a rock. We know exactly how old that rock is. Say it's 120 years old. I mean, whatever. We know exactly how old that rock is. We take it into a laboratory and we can date it with this method. And every time that I've seen that that's been done, and it's been done, a number of projects have been done, published in the literature. In every case, the date that comes back is on the order of millions and millions of years old. Every case, to my knowledge, none of them have come back too young to measure. So a question number, uh, assumption number three, I think is just wrong. It's not only a, a faulty assumption, I think it's just wrong. There's a couple other assumptions that are kind of implicit in the whole method that I haven't even written down here. They're just, they're just kind of an overriding umbrella concern. One is the assumption that the earth is old, that the earth is at least old enough to have allowed for this production of the daughter material, say in this case the lead from uranium through radiometric decay. You're assuming the old earth before you start this process. If we knew that the earth were old, then in principle this method could possibly tell us exactly how old. You know, maybe we could wiggle in on a precise date. But we're assuming the old earth here. This method is useless for testing between young earth and old earth. It's just not even applicable there. The assumption is that the earth is old. There's another assumption, implicit in, in assumption number three here, that is essentially a denial of the possibility of creation. You see, if God created the heavens and the earth on day one, he created the earth. I mean, on day three there was a, the solid continents and and I suppose there were rocks. Suppose you went out on day seven. You didn't know anything about creation, but you just went out there on day seven, and you said, I'm going to find out how old these rocks are, and you picked up a rock. Hmm. How old would that rock be? Just a few days old. I mean, that's really how old it would be. We, that is exactly how old it would be on day seven, right? How old would it appear if you took it into a laboratory and dated it by this method? it might appear to be billions of years old. I mean, it might have some lead already in that rock. In fact, I think it would have some lead in it. The Bible tells us that when God created, He created things very good. They were very good. They were just what He wanted. Did God want lead in His creation? Or did He want just uranium? I mean, would He have created a, a lead-free world? Well, lead is very important. It's on the scale of things much more important than uranium. In order for the world to be very good, it would have to have a lot of lead and, and the different isotopes of lead. You see, assumption number three denies the possibility of a creation. You might suspect, however, that since this method has such uh, questionable assumptions, you might suspect that it wouldn't work very well and I'm convinced it doesn't. I'm convinced that most of the time when, when rocks are dated with this method, the results that come back are useful to nobody. They just don't agree with anything anybody agree, believes. We have found out through our own study and through the study of the published dates in the literature that in the Grand Canyon, an area that, that I have studied a good bit and, and know, know pretty well, we have studied through uh, our, own, uh, our own studies We've gathered samples, we've sent them to the laboratories, we've dated them ourselves. We have found that these methods just simply do not work at all. There are only two lava flows in the Grand Canyon that can be dated with radiometric schemes. One is the Cardenas lavas, way down here in the bottom, 
These Cardenas lavas are one of the oldest rocks in the canyon. They're, they crop out from time to time at the river, but they are about the oldest rock in the canyon. And then there are some other lava flows up here on the surface. Uh, recent volcanism, where volcanoes that the Indians saw and ran away from uh, extruded out some lava. We can go out and collect these two lava flows and take them to laboratories and have them dated. And when we do, we find out that the results from the radiometric scheme just simply do not produce useful material, useful results at all. In fact, those, through the several methods that are used to date these rocks, there's the potassium argon, there's the rubidium strontium, there's the isochron methods of, of both, there's the uranium lead, there's the lead lead isotopes methods. Every time you date these rocks with a different method, you get a different number. So you choose which one you want. And then you can choose the one from, say, the rubidium strontium isochron down at the bottom, which gave, them, which gave a, a date of about 1.1 billion years old for the Cardenas lavas. But then you use that same method up at the top, and you get well over 2 billion years for the one up at the top. I mean, something's wrong. Something's wrong. The whole method, I'm convinced, is, is wrong. We, as young earth creationists, don't have to be intimidated by radiometric dating. It assumes an old earth, it assumes there is no creation, and it uses assumptions that, that don't seem to work very well, and not only do they not work very well, I think they are biblically wrong. Keep in mind that any effort to date the past operates on these principles, where we start with a present process, we, a present rate of a process that's going on, we can measure it today, and we make the assumption that that rate and these conditions have prevailed throughout the, the assumed ages in the past. Applying these assumptions, which are, in my opinion, invalid, we get these irrelevant results. But even when we make those assumptions, a lot of times we get information back that actually points to a young earth. In fact, every time where we take a, a world system rather than a rock, if we date the world by these methods, well, in many cases we'll get back numbers that, that point towards a date, an, an age for the earth that's much too young for evolution to, to have allowed evolution to occur. There are only a few methods, like these radiometric schemes, which tend to give large dates, millions and billions of years. But the rest of the clocks that you can conceive of point towards dates of thousands and maybe millions of years, but still far too young to, al to have allowed for evolution to occur. In fact, let me give you one of my uh, favorite examples. I've already mentioned that uranium changes into lead. As uranium changes into lead, as it, as it decays into thorium, for, say, the, um, it gives off what's called an alpha particle. A helium nuclei is what that is, two protons and two neutrons. As uranium-238 decays into thorium-234, it gives off this helium nucleus. And as it goes on through its decay chain, down through thorium-230 and, and radium and radon and polonium and on down through to lead-206, finally, the end product, it has given off, if you count here, eight alpha particles, eight helium nuclei. So helium is being produced in the crust of the earth by radiometric decay, and that nucleus is, is able then to migrate through the pores in the rock and eventually get to the surface of the earth. It is now well understood how much helium is being produced and being added to the atmosphere over, over time. We can measure the process rate. Now, this is exactly like a potato bucket. It's exactly like dating the... the uh, the rock with uranium and lead, we make a measurement of a, of a process rate in the present. We see how much helium is being added to the atmosphere in the present. We make the assumption that that rate of addition of helium to the atmosphere has always been the same throughout the past. Now, is that a valid assumption? Well, <laughs> I think not, but you see we're measuring this all over the earth. I mean, we're measuring a, a, a whole earth process. You would think that there would be a lot of helium in the atmosphere. You know what helium is. Helium is the gasoline, the, the air that you put in the, the helium balloons that float, you know, that, uh, that rise. And if you, if you suck that air, you know, you talk like this, right? That's what helium gas does. There's a good bit of helium gas in the atmosphere today. 
but there doesn't seem to be enough. If the earth were really four and a half billion years, if this process has been going on throughout the past, then there ought to be an awful lot of helium out in the atmosphere. I mean, we all ought to be talking like this. But we're not. There just doesn't seem to be much helium out here at all. In fact, we can measure the rate that helium is being added to the atmosphere. We know how fast it's coming up. And believe it or not, for every square inch of the Earth's surface, just where you're sitting there, for every square inch of the Earth's surface, about 13 million helium atoms are being added to the atmosphere each second. Now that's, that's an incredible number, but that's a number that everybody agrees with. So you see how it goes. We know how many, we can estimate how many helium atoms are in the atmosphere today. We know how fast they're being added. And all of those helium atoms can be accounted for in about two million years. The Earth's atmosphere couldn't be any more than two million years old, according to this process. Again, we're making the assumption of the present rate being responsible and being uh, at its present rate throughout the past. We've got to make the assumption that there has never been any event in the Earth's history which has added significant amounts of helium to the atmosphere from a non-radiometric source. And we've got to make the assumption that there's never been any event that came along and, and sucked all the helium off. We've got to make that assumption. Is that right? Well, probably so. We've also got to make the assumption that when the Earth was first formed, that the atmosphere as it was, was completely free of helium. There were no helium atoms at all. I'm convinced that each one of those assumptions are probably wrong. I suspect that during the time of Noah's flood, there was so much turmoil in the Earth's crust that all the helium that had generated through radiometric decay down inside the crust that was then loosened and, and came into the atmosphere more quickly than it would have otherwise. I'm also convinced that, that well, when God created, he would have created some helium here. I mean, I suspect that, that Adam and Eve wouldn't talk like this all the time. There was probably already some helium here. But given these assumptions, and in my opinion, these are the very best use of those assumptions, the very same assumptions that the evolutionists used to come up with with dates of millions and billions of years, those assumptions, faulty though they are, the best use of them points to a young Earth, or, or an Earth much too young to have allowed evolution to occur. Now, I don't buy this two million year old date. Please understand that. I'm not trying to tell you that the Earth is two millions of years old. I'm saying that it could not possibly be any older than that. I tend to think it was much younger. Given those, the biblical parameters, I suspect that the Earth's atmosphere is very much compatible with the idea that the Earth is only thousands of years old. In recent, uh, in the last couple of years, we published a, a technical monograph on this. We do try to publish books on every subject at every level there at ICR. This one here on the age of the Earth's atmosphere by Dr. Larry Vardaman is a fine, fine work. And, um, some of you like the technical material, some of you uh, don't, but if you do, this has got a lot of physics in it, and this is a, this is a real knockout punch, I'm convinced, that uh, this is just an argument that is going to last and going to stand. There's another argument that, let me, uh, that, that I like to use, and that has to do with the ocean's salt. The ocean, we all know, is salty. We can taste it. It tastes salty. But due to erosion of the continents, due to rivers coming down and into the, into the oceans, the, um, the oceans are getting more and more salty each day. And we can measure that rate. What we've tried to do is to identify every possible scheme by which salt can be added to or taken away from the ocean. Through river erosion mostly, but through glaciers, through seepage, uh, one way or the other. We've tried to identify every possible way in which salt can be added to or taken away from the ocean. And we want to calculate, again, a maximum age, so we've tried to come up with a minimum, the absolute, absolute minimum input rate and the absolute out, uh, maximum output rate. So by, by calculating the minimum input and the maximum output, we can calculate how long it would take for the oceans to have reached their present salinity starting with distilled water sometime in the past. And if we do that, we come to the conclusion that the Earth is on the order, it could not possibly be any older than 62 million years. Now, again, I don't buy the 62 million year old date, but that's starting with an ocean of distilled water. That's starting with, that's making the assumption that the flood never occurred. Obviously, if the flood occurred, then it would have added a lot more materials to the ocean that, that would have uh, derived simply by river erosion. 
making all those assumptions, we still come up with a maximum age of the Earth that's, that's far too young to have allowed evolution to take place. The point I'm trying to make is that the Earth is compatible with the idea that the, that the age of things is only on the order of thousands of years. In fact, the weight of the evidence, the bulk of the evidence points to a young Earth. There are hundreds of different clocks, like this salt in the ocean, that we could point to, that point to an age far too young to have allowed for evolution. There are only a few that points to, point to millions and billions of years. The weight of the evidence is on the side of the young Earth. I'm also convinced that there is no way, there is absolutely no way for scientists in the present to come up with an age of things. You just can't do it. Rocks don't come with labels on them. You just can't date the thing, date the earth based on present processes. The only way we can know how old things are is by going to Scripture. Scripture gives us a date. Scripture gives us a date on the order of, of a few thousand years. And the rocks are compatible with that. The Earth's systems are compatible with that. The bulk of the evidence points toward that. But Scripture is the only place we're going to get a date. I've been talking about physical processes and atmospheric processes and radiometric processes. These are not my specialties. What I really enjoy are rocks and fossils. Let me show you some geologic evidence for the young Earth. If the Earth is young, geology ought to point to that too, not just the physical processes. And I'm convinced it does. Keep in mind that I tend to think that most of the Earth's sedimentary rock, the, the rocks that we have on the crust of the Earth, are a primary result of Noah's flood. Noah's flood would have totally restructured the surface of the globe. And so when we look at rocks, we ought to be trying to interpret them through this biblical pair of glasses. The flood did all this. Well, we can't prove Noah's flood. We can't prove creation. We can't disprove evolution. But we can make predictions. Now, when scientists make predictions, they're not necessarily making predictions about the future, although sometimes scientists do. But when they say, I predict so-and-so, they're really saying that if my way of thinking is correct, if my model is correct, if if the flood really did happen, then I predict that when we look at the rocks, we ought to see certain things. I predict that the world ought to, be, ought to look this way, they would say. And so, with creation and evolution, with the idea of the flood, major dramatic event in the past versus slow and gradual uniform processes, as are uh, adhered to by the evolutionist, we can make different predictions Deformation styles is what I've labeled this section. Deformation, that's deformed. You know what deformed means? When something is bent or broken, that's deformed. Well, rocks are many times bent and broken. Rocks are deformed. The flood model would predict that during the flood, these layers of rocks, these sedimentary rocks were laid down. And then at the latter stages of the flood, those rocks may have been buckled up or bent or broken or, or things would have happened to them relatively soon after their deposition that the mud that was laid down by the floodwaters had not yet had enough time to turn into stone. A limey mud takes years, some years, to turn into limestone. A sandy deposit takes some time to turn into a sandstone. But in the flood model, we would predict that some of these deformation events, when those rocks were bent or broken, faulted, that that deformation event took place so soon after the deposition that the rocks had not yet had time to turn to hard rock. They were still in a soft, unconsolidated condition. We talk about brittle deformation and plastic deformation. The uniformitarian model, the evolutionary idea, is that these rocks were laid down and then maybe a hundred million years later they were bent or broken. And so they would have had plenty of time then to turn to solid rock, to solid stone. And they would have broken in a brittle fashion, like peanut brittle. How, how far can you bend peanut brittle? Hmm. Not very far, right? It, it breaks. It's brittle. How far can you bend saltwater taffy? You can bend it a long way, right? So that's the kind of idea that w taffy would deform in a plastic fashion as opposed to a brittle fashion.
I would predict that in many cases those rocks would have been bent and broken, deformed, while they were still in a soft, muddy condition as opposed to a hard, brittle condition. Let's talk about the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon, um, by the way, we, each year we have tours to the Grand Canyon. We uh, spend a lot of time down the Grand Canyon doing research as well as uh, taking, uh, taking individuals down with us, either hiking into the canyon or rafting uh, through, the, through the canyon on the Colorado River, or for those of you who are less adventuresome, uh, there's a bus tour of the, of the American Southwest, many, visiting many of the, um, of the uh, national parks and all through the Southwest, giving creationist interpretations as, as we go. But many of you have been to the Grand Canyon. You know what that looks like. The thing that you see standing there on the rim at the Grand Canyon Village looking across, the thing that you predominantly notice are the flat-lying layers, the sedimentary layers on the other, on the other side. Did you know that off to the side of the Grand Canyon, where, you, where those layers are buckled up, those rocks actually look like this. They're standing up on edge. Now, you may not have known that. You've got to come with us to the canyon next year. I'll introduce you to these rocks. These are some of my best friends. These rocks in places are vertical. Now, the way that happens is uh, with this sort of a geologic scenario here. It's called a monocline, where the rocks are flat in one location, and at another location they're also flat, the same rocks, while they're 7,000 feet in elevation at the rim of the Grand Canyon, that same rock over here in, in um, eastern Arizona is on the order of 2,000 feet elevation. And they've been buckled up somehow, 5,000 feet. This whole plateau has been raised up. And then the Colorado River has uh, now courses through that upwarp, carving out that canyon. But these same rocks have been buckled up into, into the higher elevations through what's called in geology a monocline. Those rocks, well, let me tell you something about those rocks. The, the, the bottom layer rock there, the, 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 the bluish layer, is the Tapete Sandstone. That's supposed to be on the order of 600 million or so years old. Let's say 600 for ease of calculation. But the time at which that uplift occurred, the time of upwarp was supposed to be 70 million years ago at the Laramide Orogeny when the, when, the, uh, when the Rocky Mountains were buckled up. So these rocks at the bottom were already 530 million years old at the time they, up, at the, at the time they uplifted. Now how long does it take for a sandy deposit to turn to sandstone? In this case, that sandstone is extremely hard. It's a hard, just a hard rock. I mean, it's a hard rock. And, and it's in a very good environment in which to solidify. It's got the cementing agents there. It's buried deeply. But yet, when it buckled up, in the, in the fault zone where it buckled up, the rocks look like this. You can see the person there for scale. Oh, you've got to come to the Grand Canyon with us. Uh, this is good stuff. As a geologist, this makes my socks roll up and down when I see things like this. <laughs> Those rocks give every indication of having been bent when they were still in a soft, plastic condition, uh, like saltwater taffy. This doesn't look like it bent like peanut brittle. This looks like it bent while it was soft and not hard. It upwarped. 70 million years ago, it was already 530 million years at the time it upwarped. I'm convinced that that 530 million years is a, a wrong number. It just did not happen. Those numbers are wrong. That rock simply was not old enough to turn to, 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 turn to stone. The mud was not old enough to have turned to stone. It was still in a soft, unconsolidated condition. Now, I'm only giving you a, a teaser on that. The, the whole world looks like this. At every location, at every, on every scale, you find soft sediment deformation. Let me give you one other example of soft sediment deformation. Tying these layers together into a, a short, short time. This is an area down in Texas, in central Texas, in the county of Rockwall, near the city of Rockwall, Rockwall, Texas. There are these unusual rock walls, you can see, shored up by the, um, by the bracings there. 
The farmers curse these things. As they plow their fields, they run into these rock walls. And so they've named the city and the county after these rock walls. The farmers there, the, the locals are absolutely convinced that a prehistoric race of giants built these walls, and it's a city, an underground city. Well, it's not a, it's not a wall. It's a, what we call a clastic dike. A clastic rock, C-L-A-S-T-I-C, clastic rock, is a rock that's built up of pieces of, of previously existing rock, like a sandstone is, is made up of sand grains, which is pieces of, of previously existing rock. And so a clastic rock is redeposited eroded remnants. In this case, these clastic dikes were squeezed up from below. They were squeezed up, actually as this whole area was uh, deformed by the, the sinking of the, of the uh, Gulf of Mexico, that basin, as it down warped, it, it squeezed up stuff. The, the, the surrounding rock, the host rock in which these dikes are found, is Cretaceous on the order of uh, say a hundred million years old. Now I don't buy those dates, understand, but I'm just giving you the normal interpretation. The rock is on the order of a hundred million years old, but yet the source rock down below was, was maybe 30 million years older than that. The time of squeezing up was 70 million years ago. And so at the time of squeezing, this rock down here was already, oh, about 60 million years old by the time it squeezed up. And yet it gives every indication of having squeezed up in a soft condition. We can see the flow patterns. It was not solid. How long does it take a sandstone to turn to solid rock deeply buried in Cretaceous, in, in a limestone area, pre presence of uh, abundant cement? It doesn't take long. It might take years. It might take 10 years. It might take 100 years. But in 60 million years, it ought to have turned to stone by now. Do you see how it works? By showing that all of these layers were laid down in less than the length of time it takes for one layer to turn to stone, we have wiped out, in this case, about 60 million years. At the Grand Canyon, we wiped, up over, wiped out over 500 million years. There are clastic dikes in a number of places around the world. This is in the, the edge of the Rocky Mountains, near the Garden of the Gods area, in which case these clastic dikes, again, wipe out over 500 million years of, the, of supposed time. Well, the point of all this is, the rocks do not give us a date for the age of the earth. It doesn't date, the, rocks just can't do it. Scientists can't do it. The only place we're going to get a date for the age of the earth is in Scripture. But if we go to Scripture and get that date and put on those biblical glasses and then look at the rocks and the fossils, we're going to find, my goodness, the rocks and fossils agree. They, they are what they should be if the Bible is correct. We can have confidence that the Bible is correct because geology is so compatible, compatible with it. And geology is not necessarily very compatible with the evolutionary old earth idea. And the point of this whole seminar is that, folks, the Bible's right. I mean, it's just right. It's right. We can trust it when it talks about the age of things. It's right when we talk about creation or evolution. It's right when it talks about our children, how to raise them. It's right when it talks about our marriage. It's right when it talks about the fact that Christ died for our sins. Jesus told Nicodemus, he says, if you don't believe it when I tell you about earthly things, how can you believe it when I tell you about heavenly things? Jesus has told us about the age of things, and we can check it, and it looks like he's right. And because the Bible is so well validated in all these other areas, we can have confidence that it's right when it's talking about things we can't check. Folks, the Bible's right. We need to go back to Genesis, get our biblical glasses on, and then look at the world, and when we do, we'll see that it works. John, 6,000 years or so for the age of the earth does sound rather radical, but aren't there a number of scientists coming up with evidences for a young earth? Yes, there are, Ken, and at ICR we've published several books which detail some of these evidences. I, I already mentioned uh, Larry Vardaman's technical monograph on helium in the atmosphere. We should also mention the fairly technical book, Scientific Creationism, which has an excellent chapter on the age question. I'd also like to mention the book that you co-authored with your father, Dr. Henry Morris, entitled Science, Scripture, and the Young Earth. In this book, you answer many of the objections raised by Christian geologists who insist on incorporating an old earth concept into Genesis. While we're talking about the age question, we should also mention the two technical journals published, uh, one by the Creation Research Society and the other by the Creation Science Foundation in Australia. Information on both of these journals can be obtained through ICR. These and other creation materials, including other programs in this Back to Genesis series, have been mightily used by God to answer questions, both biblical and scientific, to convince skeptics of the truth of creation, to train up children in the way they should go, 
to establish the importance of creation to the Christian faith. They can be ordered by calling toll-free 1-800-999-3777 or by writing the Institute for Creation Research, P.O. Box 2667, El Cajon, California, 92021. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good.